Okay, well, it is one o'clock, so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Nate Weston. I'm a program coordinator with the Beaver Watershed Alliance. We are a, a small 501c3, 501c3 nonprofit uh, located in Springdale, Arkansas, and um, our goal, our role, well, hang on a second because I just closed my PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> So we are a nonprofit dedicated to the protection of water quality in the Beaver Lake watershed in Northwest Arkansas. There we go. And our mission statement is to protect, proactively protect, enhance, and sustain the water quality in Beaver Lake and the integrity of its uh, watershed. There we go. Sorry, we're having te technical difficulties on my end here. <laughs> Um, the way we do that is through the, uh, education and outreach, um, technical assistance, and BMPs. Um, BMPs is just jargon for best management practices, and uh, we also do some scientific monitoring and uh, research, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the future. Um, we're going to keep this primarily to this program, um, which is a, uh, a program. Uh, it's a pilot program in cooperation with the National Resource Conservation Services. Uh, through their uh, conservation innovation grants. And then the goal of this program is to increase the infrastructure for the production of native plant materials in the Northwest Arkansas region um, through a series of approximately 20 high tunnels. Um, these high tunnels would produce native plant materials which are used for conservation, uh, landscaping, and uh, various other practices up, up here in our, in our watershed and just through the entire region. Um, if successful, this program could hypothetically be adopted through the NRCS's High Tunnel Program, uh, which is a, an eventuality we're, we're very excited about to uh, potentially have that, have that done. And um, if successful, that program could hypothetically be adopted nationally. And so you know, places in, in any other states could also produce uh, native plant materials local to their region uh, through this highly successful program. Um, the NRCS high tunnel program is currently limited to the, to the production of cut flowers and uh, vegetables. And so that's, that's the reason, the motivating factor of why we're doing this. Um, the Beaver Lake watershed, uh, our biggest mission is source water protection. Uh, over here on the left side of my screen, you see the outline of our, of our watershed. Again, that's up in Northwest Arkansas. Um, just west of this map, you would see a, a metropolitan area of um, Fayetteville, Springdale, Bentonville, Rogers, and um, it's this is the 14th fastest growing region in the entire United States, primarily driven by several growing retail companies, as well as uh, food production companies. Um, one of the biggest issues we're having in this area is land use change, and that land use change due from urbanization and uh, agricultural management is um, tends to cause uh, some some changes in the landscape, such as erosion and uh, things like that. Um, several areas in our watershed have been identified as high priority for managing erosion, such as you see here on the screen. Um, in those in those watersheds, is, which are colored red, these are uh, listed as high high priority areas for managing erosion and reducing erosion. Um, and this is all to reduce the erosion going into Beaver Lake up in the north side of the, of the image in the watershed. Um, this is the drinking water source for one in six Arkansans, or roughly 500,000 people. And um, sediment is the number one contributor to, to the reduction of water quality, at least in our region, because it leads to algal blooms and, and things like that, and uh, loss of, of wildlife habitat and streams. Um, this is a map of our 
water provider or water utility providers in the area. Um, as you can see uh, with those blue lines, water is drawn from Beaver Lake and it gets distributed all throughout the region through these various uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary uh, water providers. Um, some of the local attendees today might recognize some of the some of the towns in which they live and might see some of the um, uh, water utility providers listed there. <clears throat> Um, as you can see, uh, some of the water is drawn from the north side of the lake and goes all the way down to, to the southwest side of our watershed, as well as some going into Oklahoma. Um, the 2020 population projection for this area is roughly 518,000 residents, and uh, it's expected to grow up to close to a million by 2045. We're an extremely rapidly growing region in the United States, and uh, that has its, its complications and challenges that we face as, as an organization. and. Uh, and with our partners, um, <clears throat> one of the one of the key ways we we uh, help source water protection in our area is through education and outreach. Uh, we do things such as what we're doing here uh, through webinars. Um, you know, in times before uh, COVID nineteen, we we had uh, in person workshops, farm field days, and uh, we work with several partners. Um, we see some folks here from the from the Nature Conservancy. There's some good partners with us. Um, Game and Fish Commission and uh, Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission and several others. <clears throat> um, we also work closely with landowners uh, through technical assistance and landowner site assessments. So we routinely go out with landowners and we talk to them about their land management goals and we help them meet those goals. We make recommendations to them for the implementation of voluntary best management practices, whether it's to promote uh, wildlife habitat, um, native plant uh, areas or erosion prevention, stormwater management, and several things like that. Um, another thing we're heavily looking at is uh, forestry health and forestry management. <clears throat> uh, we work with some partners. We don't have funding for this ourselves, but we do work with some partners with uh, federal grants to uh, implement um, stream bank restoration projects. Uh, this was done, I believe, on the West Fork of the White River, a uh, heavily impaired section. And uh, many of y'all might recognize this as uh, Rosgen's natural channel designs. Uh, it's pretty heavily featured in a lot of the work we do. Um, come in and uh, we stabilize the stream, well, our partners and uh, stabilize the stream banks and um, replenish vegetation after uh, in, uh, reintroducing mink line to these stream banks. Uh, we do some scientific monitoring, such as what we see here. Um, this was a heavily eroded or incised stream bank we see. I think this might have been on the west, on the uh, Fort Eagle Creek. And uh, this is pretty common in some of our areas. Uh, we have very flashy streams up here in the Ozarks, and uh, they can go from a small trickle like we see here to a raging torrent in just one one rain event. And uh, this, you know, depending on Depending on land management practices and things like that, this can this can potentially cause a lot of erosion. We've had some some of our agricultural producers and ranchers go out and find they've lost 20 feet of stream bank uh, just in overnight. It's uh, pretty shocking, and as you can imagine, some of those landowners are are pretty terrified and saddened that the land that's been in their family for generations is suddenly down the river. <clears throat> um, we do some uh, scientific research. Uh, this is a um, this is a project we've been working on down in the, in the West Fork of the White River watershed to potentially reduce uh, peak flow in the watershed through the implementation of stormwater ponds at uh, first first order catchment basins. Um, these these catchment basins would could hypothetically um, reduce the amount of peak flow in the in the watershed and in those higher tributaries. And uh, as you can see on those graphs, we're seeing some pretty promising results on that. We're looking forward to continuing that in the future. And um, all this all this ties in with uh, this this greater program of native plant materials and uh, this conservation innovation grant that we're working on with uh, several partners. Uh, we do have a couple speakers here today that are going to talk about um, propagating native plants and licensing. That's uh, it, the licensing part's probably going to be very particular to Arkansas. Um, I know we have some. Some participants here today who are not from our who are not from Arkansas, and um, <clears throat> but uh, we still think some of the material here is is going to be very relevant to, to you all as well. Um, we use native plants a lot in a lot of our practices and a lot of our activities. Um, 
We have a lot of landowners who just want to see wildlife in their yard and they want to see their gardens and their landscaping more more interact and uh, more integrated with the natural landscape and natural resources. And so they like planting things like the the butterfoot butter uh, button bush like we see up here in the top left so they can see uh, pollinators, things like that. Um, we have several landowners who do tree plantings in our watershed. Um, we have native seed collections for some of the restoration programs like we saw earlier, uh, where they here are going out and collecting a, uh, a type of riparian rye uh, for, for use in their replantings. Um, some of the, we have one participant who is uh, also active in a program with Audubon Arkansas, uh, where they are producing, already producing native plants through that program, which is highly successful and uh, highly popular in this area. <clears throat> and um, we work with landowners in public areas to, to install uh, riparian buffer demonstrations and uh, restore some of the riparian areas we see, as well as uh, low impact development or LID, where, uh, we, where native plants and native, uh, native plant materials are used to protect um, filter storm water as it as it flows off impervious or impervious surfaces like concrete and pavement things like that. Um, we can't do this alone. We have several partners that help us with this. Um, to do anything successful, you have to have a, a wide range of partners. <clears throat> um, and uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to enter it in the chat box down at the or not the chat box, but the Q and A section down at the bottom of your screen. Um, we do also have a, a series of poll questions down at the bottom of your screen, so feel free to interact with that. Um, this is also one of four uh, series in this program. This is the second of four. Uh, if you haven't seen the first one or weren't able to register for the first one, it should be up on our YouTube channel, uh, which, you, which uh, should be on here later, or I can also offer that to you, or if you're curious, you can enter it in the chat or in the question box, and we can also also answer it there. Um, with that, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, introduce Rose Gergerich. She is our she is our first speaker for today. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and stop my screen share. Rose, if you'd like to st start sharing, and I'll introduce you. <clears throat> so Rose is the head of the Northwest Arkansas Master Naturalist Native Plant Team. Uh, she grew up on a dairy farm in northern Wisconsin, where she learned to grow and appreciate plants from her parents and grandparents. Uh, she retired from the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville after a 30-year career as a professor in the Department of Plant Pathology with a specialization in plant virology. She now lives in the Boston Mountains of southern Washington County Ar here in Arkansas. Um, she's an active member of the Northwest Arkansas, Ar or excuse me, Northwest Arkansas chapter of Master Naturalists where she helps with the native plant team. Uh, Rose enjoys walking with, uh, working with fellow master naturalists in the greenhouse and nursery on her property where the master naturalists propagate plants for their distribution in Northwest Arkansas. <clears throat> and Rose, we thank you very much for participating today. Okay, first of all, can people hear me? All right. <laughs> um, Nate, thank you for the opportunity to spread the word about native plants and about our program for producing native plants. Um, uh, I would use the caveat to say we are all amateurs in our group. Uh, we have 300 different volunteers within our Northwest Arkansas Master Naturalist chapter, and a lot of them work with our native plant um, uh, effort. Another uh, caution that I should say is We've, over the last nine years, we've developed um, a series of um, procedures and materials that we use. And this is just what we've developed, what works for us. There are a lot of other uh, resources and ways to do the things that we do. So this is just our story, you know, what, what we've um, been able to accomplish. And uh, so what we have is a native plant team within our Northwest Arkansas Master Naturalist chapter. And um, oh, I can't see my slides when I do that. Okay. Um, hang on. So um, this was um, what one of our members called um, a perfect storm. 
So nine years ago, um, we came to realize that there was a lot of local interest in native plants and uh, a lack of commercial sources, especially uh, with locally derived uh, dermplasm. And we had a lot of very interested and energetic uh, master naturalist volunteers. So we started this as a self-supporting program within our organization. And uh, we did have at that time, um, I'm happy to say, let me see. a propagation facility. It's my own, my sort of bucket list uh, greenhouse that I built after uh, I retired. So it was all set for um, things to happen uh, nine years ago and this is uh, sort of the story of the evolution of it. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do is go through and talk about what we do over the course of a year. So in the course of a year, we, we um, start with seeds and we go all the way to uh, plants that we're selling at our um, sales and so on. So um, I'll just go through these different uh, uh, areas here. Our overall objective in the native plant team is to encourage the use of native plants by providing them, not just selling them, but providing them to city, cities, uh, state parks, nonprofit organizations uh, um, along our greenway, which is really important in our uh, part of the world. Um, and then also to educate ourselves and others about the utility uh, and beauty of growing native plants. So I'm not gonna talk about a lot of that. I'm gonna talk about the actual procedure that we end up uh, using. This is um, our, where we do our work. Um, this is a, uh, my hobby greenhouse, which is now turned into a propagation greenhouse for master naturalists. And then um, this is uh, our head house, which is uh, some people would call a garage. We call it our head house now. I don't think it's ever seen a car, actually, now that I think about it. Um, and on this, you can see here um, our volunteers. Uh, that are working here transplanting plants and then eventually um, our plants go into what we call our container yard. So this is all um, at our place um, south of West Fork. So um, our goal uh, is to propagate uh, genetically diverse plants that are adapted to our environment and our wildlife and we do this by using for the most part plants that are produced from seed and seed from locally collected, uh, collected from local plants. Um, these uh, seeds are the result of pollination, so it's got the um, representation of the normal genetic genetics of plants in our area. And uh, the seed is collected um, locally, um, and then also from, um, we do source plants from nurseries in our region. Uh, this is a, the, the point of using locally derived genetics is a, it's a selling point for um, people who are producing native plants. And as people begin to understand the need for that, uh, that will become um, an even greater selling point. So in our project uh, right now, um, we are at the point where uh, we've located native plants, we've identified them, and um, uh, so this is the, we're just finishing up um, this part of it. And um, this is a, this shows sort of our, our master naturalist in learning mode. This is a yard uh, in Rogers, uh, Warren Fields, who's sort of the guru uh, of our group, has completely converted his front yard and backyard to native plants. And um, we're here learning about native plants so we have like a little lecture sort of thing beforehand. And then we actually go out and Warren talks about the native plants, their uses. And then um, I'm busy here with my group collecting seeds at the same time. So um, we also collect seed. This is our driveway. And if you walk down our driveway any time of the growing season, you'll see uh, little uh, flags and in indications that we're collecting. This is the plant we want to collect from. And what I found is that I can, I can identify a plant when it's flowering and I can find it, it's very obvious. Once it stops flowering, it gets lost. So 
Uh, we, we are flagging plants um, along our highways and along our driveway. And that, that procedure varies. I mean, in the early um, days, we're labeling um, uh, the early flocks. Now we're labeling uh, goldenrod. So, and then that shows us where the plants are and where we should collect. Uh, and another important uh, point for collecting seed is identification. And we use various resources and people to make sure that when we're collecting what we call cardinal flower, it is actually cardinal flower um, or blue lobelia or monkey flower, whatever. So, and the best time to do that, of course, is when they're flowering. So we make use of our uh, local taxonomists and so on to make sure that we know uh, what we're collecting. We also, in terms of collecting seeds, we get permission. Now, even though we have planted a lot of plants out at, for instance, Lake Weddington, at the um, Forest Service, uh, Lake Weddington Park, um, we still ask permission before we go in to collect from those plants or from plants that are in their um, uh, area there. Um, when we collect, we generally collect from several plants within a, a, a cluster. Again, looking at uh, increasing the diversity we have, and we collect from different locations. So right now I am anxiously waiting for our cardinal flowers to fully set seed. They're not ripe yet. And I have three different locations that I'll collect from, but they're not quite ready. Um, don't collect from rare species, that's obvious. Um, wait until the seed is ripe, because if it's not ripe and ready, uh, it won't eventually germinate. Um, so you have to kind of learn how to judge, uh, for instance, with our cardinal flowers. Uh, I have to learn when to collect the seeds. And it is a sort of a, a compromise because there are a lot of other creatures out there collecting seed. And um, we want to get to the seed before the uh, catbirds and, and other birds uh, collect them ahead of us. So for harvesting seeds, uh, plants with fresh, fleshy berries, I'm thinking uh, beauty berry, uh, spice bush, we wait until the fruit is soft and can come off easily. Kind of like when you pick apples, the same, same uh, idea. Uh, for grasses, we just strip off the seeds. And then I'll show you some examples of seed capsules that explode and, and they take sort of a special uh, consideration. So, so just to emphasize here, every plant, every type of plant and seed is unique. And you have to learn how to deal with uh, the uniqueness all the way through the propagation process. This shows um, inland sea oats. I'm probably this afternoon, I will collect the ones in our, in our woods just by stripping off uh, the uh, seeds from the seed pod. This is a little more difficult. This is a tulip tree. Tulip trees are very tall. So you might have problems uh, getting up there and, and collecting the seed. Uh, this is an interesting one. The first year we collected, um, so this is a wild petunia. It has a beautiful uh, blue uh, flower. And then this is the seed pod. So if you wait, that seed pod, um, when it's mature, it springs open and spreads out the seeds um, three, six feet. And what we found the first year when I collected the pod, first of all, I had trouble finding pods with seeds in because they'd all been dispersed. Then I, I put them into a plastic bag, like you see here on our dining room table. And we kept hearing this weird popping song and we're wondering what's wrong, what, what's going on in our house? And it was the seeds, the, the seed pods dispersing uh, in this sack with a, with a loud pop. Now we know and we listen for it and enjoy it. Uh, you're probably, a lot of you are familiar with Touch Me Not, uh, which is a beautiful um, flower, impatient, uh, a beautiful flower to grow. And it also has an explosive seed dispersal. So as soon as you touch it, as many of you know, it pops open and the seeds are gone. So with this, we just grab onto the, the, the seed head and hang tight and they um, pop into our, our palms and we can collect them. Some seeds are more challenging than others. This is a Kentucky coffee tree. And literally, you have to use pliers to break open these pods. Um, and um, it's just, like I said, each seed, each plant is unique. Uh, we do use commercial seed sources. Uh, Lissa gave a wonderful selection of, of seed sources. 
in the uh, her presentation, so you can refer to that. Um, these are local or regional uh, seed sources. We don't get, we don't use a nursery in Missouri, for example. Now, um, of course, one of the things we're looking for in propagation is variation. If you want the natural genetic variation, but sometimes we get variation uh, we don't really want. And this is a really, um, it illustrates that very well. Um, in, the, in this image here, you see this lavender, beautiful looking seedling, grass seedling. Well, that is a chlorophyll mutant of purple top grass. And the purple top grass uh, normally is green, but when you take away the green, if it's a mutant, it's that lovely lavender. Uh, in two or three days, it dies because it doesn't have chlorophyll. But again, it, it illustrates the diversity that you get. This slide here, this is actually a white, pure white seedling um, of a, one of the milkweeds. I don't remember which one. And uh, there were like four of them in this one flat. And of course, they died after a couple of days too. But it, it really illustrates the variation that we get in our seed collections. Now, sometimes that variation is not something we want, and we have to um, look at the seedlings that we're growing that, and, and eliminate the ones that we don't want. Now, a, this is Kentucky coffee tree, and uh, this is what it would look like a, a normal uh, seedling here. Uh, this one is kind of a bonsai. It, it grew, I mean, it never got very big. Um, and maybe someone, maybe some horticulturist would want it, but we certainly wouldn't want to sell it to someone who, who wanted a, a big Kentucky coffee tree. So um, uh, you see the, the, uh, uh, the advantages of having genetic diversity, but also the, uh, you, that you have to watch out that you're actually not propagating something that people won't want. Um, so for our trees, we actually use um, tree and shrub seedlings most of them we do not grow. Uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation has a tree seedling program and they sell uh, one to two year old seedlings. Uh, we get them bare rooted and then we plant them out in the pots in our nursery um, for use and sale. Um, and this is a huge operation that they have up there. They talk about um, you know, like 5,000 pounds of black walnut seeds for them to, to process and, and grow. The trees. So a very, a very. If you have time, go to their website, which I've got listed in my references at the end of the talk, and just look at the beautiful uh, plants that they have available. But again, grown from seed, natural diversity. Sometimes <clears throat> we can't do this. Um, this is my nemesis. This is yellow honeysuckle. It's a beautiful native, uh, grows in the woods, um, but one of our native honeysuckles. And I've wanted to grow it for a long time. And for several years, I struggled. And I collected the seeds, and I worked with them, and so on. Didn't work. Finally, I called Mary Ann King at uh, Pine Ridge. I said, Mary Ann, how do you propagate yellow honeysuckle? And she said, oh, she said, I used to try to grow them from seed. It doesn't work. I said, OK, I'm good. Um, so now uh, what I did was I went into the woods and, and uh, layered these in, in pots. In other words, taking the vine and putting it in a pot and so that it would uh, form roots. And now we have our own propagation bed for yellow honeysuckle, but it's not genetically diverse. It's, it's very uniform. Uh, it comes from one location in our woods. So when we're collecting seed, we always have a, um, uh, once we get a seed collect, uh, a collection of seed, we um, have information that goes with it. And that information goes along with the seed as it travels through our propagation setup. So we have a common name, a scientific name. Um, it was, this was collected by uh, Warren Fields, so his name. It was collected in Rogers. Uh, this information here, which we try to get hold of right away, and you'll see why, is how we have to treat the seed before we um, actually are, are uh, planting it. And this goes into a database, same information on the, on the database here. And you can see here this column here on seed treatment, which I will refer to um, as we come through. So we might have you know, 250 different uh, seed collections uh, in this database by the time, by the end of the season. So we've harvested our seeds. Uh, and we have a lot of people doing this. 
uh, in different locations, which is the beauty of having a huge um, volunteer force uh, to help us with this. So now the next step is to clean and store seeds. And I will tell you, um, we also have workshops with this. We couldn't this year because of the pandemic, but we will pull in probably three dozen people into the Washington County Extension Office and we explain to them how to clean the seeds and they sit there for hours and, and clean seeds for us, which makes our life a lot easier. So again, uh, education is part of our, our program. So why do we do seed cleanup? Well, first of all, it removes um, a lot of the extraneous material, as I'll show you, that's associated with the seed, and that um, might lead to um, mold and so on when we're storing the seed. For um, berries, we remove the flesh, and I'll give you an example of that. Uh, we um, take off extraneous parts of the seed, and I will explain that too. Um, so you can, you can uh, go online and, and purchase a lot of expensive sieves and so on to be able to clean the seed and separate the seed from organic material. But we have a lovely collection that, uh, that has come together through uh, different people bringing in uh, uh, sieves and so on with very uh, uh, big um, holes in the sieves, so extremely fine, so we can separate the seeds from um, the um, extraneous material. Okay, this is a good example of um, a seed. It's a fleshy uh, fruit. Many of you are familiar with it. It's beautiful this time of the year. We're about to collect ours. And so this is collected when they're, they're fully ripe. And then we just kind of take them and, and mash them up and, and get, get the seeds uh, separated from the the um, um, flesh and uh, fruit of the berry. And then, and we've developed this over the years, I used to pick out the, the seeds and so on, but now um, we take the, this mashed up mess here and put it into a tall cylinder and swirl it around and the seeds very nicely sink to the bottom and as you're, you continue to swirl it, all of the other material is on the top. So you pour off the the top part and eventually you end up with almost 100% uh, clean seed and then they're dried and uh, stored from there. So uh, different techniques uh, that we've learned to um, uh, clean seed and of course commercial production um, is, is um, uh, mechanized to do this sort of thing. Excuse me. So this is our tulip seed, tulip tree seed. And you can see on the top, we've got these um, wings on here and, and the seed is actually down here. So we can um, remove um, just the seed part and, and store that for you. This is, I believe this is Joe Pie Weed. You know, you see here a lot of fluff associated with it. Here it's been cleaned and uh, ready for, for storage. So three important things for seed storage. Uh, one is temperature. We store in the, once everything is dried, it's stored in our refrigerator. Um, uh, moisture, uh, just for storing the seed, it's dry, dry moisture. And, and um, they're in small Ziploc freezer bags and they remain dry. Actually, our seed collection at this point, those seeds can be used for years. We have a collection of um, columbine seed that is probably now six or seven years old. And every year we take a teaspoon of the, of the seeds and, and plant them and they're still viable. So this becomes a, a seed bank. So we have um, seeds collected in different years that we can go back to if we need to. And again, label, label, label. That label stays with the seed. We have learned, or I have learned, that we never, if we have a question about a seed identification, we don't say, well, let's plant it and see what it is. No, we, we we don't deal with it because it takes resources and time away from us. We have to know what uh, the plant is if we're going to uh, spend our time and energy to propagate it. This is what our refrigerator starts to look like um, this time of the year. So we have our cauliflower and carrots and then our, our seed collection here. Ziploc bags, uh, the label uh, goes with the, the bags, stored cold and dry. Okay, so now we've got them in the refrigerator. Um, one of the things with, with uh, seeds is that a lot of them are dormant. So they, they won't, well, let me show you. 
you have to treat them um, so that because they will not germinate unless they go through a winter or whatnot. So they're dormant. Uh, and this is a protection for the plant because the ones that are being produced now should not be um, germinating because they're going to get frosted in a couple weeks. So uh, I'll tell you a story that illustrates the lack of dormancy. Uh, this is a beautiful little huh, elm seedling. And this spring, after we had our plants in the container yard, we had literally thousands of these seedlings coming up in our pots in the nursery. And many hours, volunteer hours, were spent pulling those little seedlings out. And this is a plant, okay, blooms in spring. So it's got the full growing season to be able to, to grow and mature. And uh, immediately after production, they are cap they can grow, they can germinate and grow. So these are plants that have no dormancy. So when you're planting your nursery, you might not want to have a uh, elm tree right over your container yard, or you'll end up spending a lot of time pulling out um, baby elm seedlings. No dormancy in that case. But about two thirds of our plants um, do require some sort of treatment. A lot of the grasses don't, but about two thirds of them do. So then the question is what sort of treatments um, do growers use to overcome that dormancy and to, and, and more importantly, to get consistent germination. So they germinate when you plant them. So it's not germinating over the next three or four months. So what do, what treatments are needed? And there is a beautiful uh, website. It's, and I've got the reference at the end. It's the Lake to Prairie Wild Ones website. And on that website, they, um, it, it has a whole laundry list of native plants and the treatments that are needed to get them to germinate. So first of all, no pretreatment. They go in the refrigerator and they're ready to plant. Um, hot water treatment. This one always bothers me because you literally end up pouring hot water over your seeds. And I always think of those tender little embryos in there and how they can stay in that. But with that hot water treatment, you're breaking the, the seed coat, which is uh, not permeable to water. So there are only a couple, but there are a couple that we pour hot water, boiling water on in some cases. The most common one uh, uh, treatment is moist, cold stratification. And that uh, stratification is just uh, mimicking winter. So a lot of these plants go through winter and then they can germinate. So our, our this treatment uh, mimics what seeds would naturally go through. And, and you can actually, as I said, this is what we do. You can actually plant seeds out in the fall and they'll go through a winter and most of them will stratify and, and germinate. Uh, but this is the way we do it. So let me just explain that. And again, here's with the, the um, uh, caveat that we, uh, this is what we use to stratify our seeds. There are a lot of recipes out there and, and they, a lot of them work really well. But this is the one that we've come up with. And that is we use a combination of sphagnum uh, peat moss and uh, it's milled so it's in small pieces and it's moistened, not wet, just moistened. And uh, then that's combined in a one-to-one -one mixture with sand and it's not ocean sand, it's sand that's pretty inert and we buy it and we bake it. So I put it in a big pan and put it in the oven and bake it at you know 300 degrees for two or three hours. Kills everything in it, and then it's ready for our uh, to be used in our seed uh, um, stratification. So this is the the moistened peat moss. Again, it's you shouldn't be able if you squeeze it, no water should really come dripping out of it. So it's moist, but not uh, wet. And early on, we had some that we was too wet and that encourages um, mold and rot. <clears throat> I will say that one of the reasons we've gone to the sphagnum peat moss, and this is sphagnum peat moss, um, it's just one of the possibilities, but sphagnum peat moss has antibacterial and antifungal properties. So it helps to reduce the possibility of, of molding and rot. And with this mixture, we rarely get any, any um, molding or rotting in our, in our stratification mixes. So this is the sand. Um, it also is moistened <clears throat> and it's been um, well baked. 
So this is our dining room table, uh, repurposed uh, here. And you can see the, the uh, tray of um, moist um, peat moss. Here's our sand. And then we've got seeds, our label, of course. And then we make a mixture, uh, generally three to four times the volume of the seed with this mixture of peat and, uh, and, and moist peat and moist sand. So. And that, um, so like I said, about two thirds of our seedlings actually go through stratification. Unfortunately, for scheduling purposes, they have different <clears throat> times that are recommended for stratification. So if we're thinking of planting in mid-February, <clears throat> we actually have to be um, planning ahead to four months before that to stratify our seeds because um, if we, if we stratify them in mid-October, they'll be ready in mid-February. Others need only three months of cold moist, others two months, others one month. So you, you kind of have to backtrack and that determines uh, when you stratify so that you're planning everything about the same time. And again, all of this information is on our, our, uh, our, our sheet here. So uh, you, can, you, you know, just looking at the, the inventory, which ones have to be stratified at one month. <clears throat> so at this point, all of the plants, all of the seed um, sources are numbered. So we have a, um, Texas Green Eyes, we have here two collections, and they're numbered 238 and 239. And this helps us um, keep track of our seed sources. So if we, if we get some weird um, plant that's not what we want, we know we have to go back to our, our seed uh, source. So this is what the refrigerator starts to look like. We have them, we now separate them out into those, all those seeds that require one month cold moist stratification or no treatment. And then, and then we just pull those out and uh, stratify them when at the appropriate time. And we have um, a seed stratification workshop, again, educating our, our, our uh, volunteers where we meet at the Washington County Extension uh, classroom. We have you know, 30 people come and they're helping us make up these mixtures of peat moss and sand and the seed um, and getting them ready for stratification. Okay, and then um, uh, another one treatment that we sometimes have to use is scarification. And this is really abrading the, the, the seed coat of these seeds is impermeable to, impermeable to water. So what we're doing is we're breaking the seed coat um, so that water can get in and germination can occur. So back to our uh, recalcitrant Kentucky coffee tree seed. Um, this, this seed is impermeable and it won't grow if you, if you plant it as it is. Eventually it will, but it'll take a long time. And here we're teaching people how to break that seed coat. So this is just a file and they're you know, rubbing it on there. But uh, some of our master naturalists are very um, creative and they decided that the best way to break that seed coat was just to take it on the concrete and um, or the cement and brush it against there. And they were very successful in, in not messing with a file or anything. Um, so then you end up with something like this. You can see the seed coat has been um, broken in this area and water can get in. So that's called scar, scarification. And not a lot of our plants need that, but a lot of the legumes um, seem to, or the bean family plants seem to need that. For smaller seeds, um, we use sandpaper to break apart the, the seed coat. Uh, this is just um, between two pieces of sandpaper and um, um, gently, you don't want to kill the, the, the seed, seedling. Um, that's how we stratify. This is the hot water treatment which I don't like to do. <laughs> it just makes me nervous, but it works. Again, uh, breaking apart that, that seed coat. Um, some seeds need light to, to break dormancy and germinate. And a good example of this are lobelias, tiny little seeds. So when we plant these, we do not cover them. We just sprinkle them over the surface of the pot of the soil. 
and then we bottom water uh, so that we're not disturbing those seeds and uh, we get good germination. If we planted them deep or covered them up, uh, they wouldn't get the light that they need to germinate. So again, each seed is unique and requires different things. And just in case you think it's fairly straightforward, there's actually some seeds that require a, a different uh, treatment, the same seed. So here's our blue wild indigo, beautiful plant. Um, scientific name collected by Ken Leonard at the Botanic Gardens of the Ozark back in uh, 2017. So with this seed, scarify it with sandpaper. Okay, so we're, we're breaking the seed coat. And then you cold moist stratify it for 10 days. And then you inoculate it with uh, the appropriate uh, rhizobium and plant it. I'm not gonna talk about rhizobium, but the legume, uh, legumes that we plant, a lot of them do much better if they have rhizobium inoculum applied. And that's just the nitrogen fixing bacteria that allows the plant to take nitrogen uh, from the air and, 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 uh, and uh, fix that nitrogen for the use of the plant. So again, another seed treatment, probably have a dozen uh, seed lots that we use that way. And you can purchase that rhizobium commercially. So um, another example here is um, Shrubby St. John's Word, beautiful little shrub uh, with uh, golden uh, blooms on it. And that one, you put it into the stratification mixture, you leave it for a month at room temperature, and then you throw it into the uh, refrigerator for three months. So again, each, each seed is unique and you have to be aware of the special needs for these seeds. Okay, now we've got them. Uh, they're um, um, processed, ready to plant, and we're gonna do planting and transplanting. So finally, we're getting to the stage where we're gonna grow some plants. So in, in preparing to plant, we have the seed and they're treated as necessary. <clears throat> and we have our pots. Now we have a, <clears throat> a program within Master Naturalist. We are uh, determined that we're gonna recycle pots as much as we can because those pots and thousands, tens of thousands of them would go into um, our uh, trash stream here. Uh, but if we can recycle them, and they're, I mean, they're perfectly good pots, um, but they're dirty. So we have a process that we use to clean those uh, pots before we use them. And then also in terms of pots, we have different size pots for different applications, and I'll point some of those out. So um, this is <clears throat> this is how we started out uh, in a little tub with some 10% bleach, and uh, we would put our pots in there for 30 minutes, and we'd have you know maybe go through three or four tubs, um, and we'd have uh, clean disinfected pots that we can use. Of course, after they're bleached, they're rinsed really well and dry. Um, now, we use three 100-gallon stock tanks that we fill with 10% uh, bleach. And um, um, that allows us to process a lot of pots. So this is what our garage uh, side looked like a couple weeks ago. And these are all recycled pots. We get them from um, Crystal Bridges. They have a lot of... They, plant a lot of plants that they purchase, and then we uh, get their recycled pots. So, and uh, so not just pots, but also our, our trays and flats are recycled. So why do our, our bleach? Uh, there are <clears throat> pathogens, especially root pathogens, that reside in pots. And if those, if those plants are in those pots for a long period of time, or they're coming from the West Coast, they have some uh, horrible root infecting pathogens that we don't want here. And uh, it just starts off our, our um, process with clean material that we know is not going to have um, uh, root infecting or plant infecting pathogens in them. This is what they look like when they're all clean. They're in the garage and ready to go. And you can see the different size pots that we have here. We have these, uh, these here are tall tree pots that we plant trees in, uh, the gallon size pots, the small pots that we use for um, our early sales, so a lot of variety and all recycled. So this is finding, we're getting to the point where we're, we're um, um, planting 
And this just shows a, uh, one day's effort of planting uh, seeds uh, into our, what we call our germination pots. They're kind of squatty uh, looking pots um, and all, of course, labeled. Sometimes we plant into flats <clears throat> and all of our grasses go into flats as well as a lot of plants that we're, we want a lot of, like purple coneflower always goes into a couple flats. What we've uh, come up with with our grasses is really interesting. So you plant into a flat like this and you get a little lawn of uh, turf grass, right? Whether it might be inland seals, for instance. So we take that, you can pull it out, it's a mat, and we just uh, cut it into little pieces and that, that goes into a large um, gallon sized pot that we eventually grow outside and, and sell. So um, it's very easy to, to transplant those. Um, the soil mix uh, we use, and, and again, this is there are a lot of variations on this, but we use a soil mix called ProMix, um, and it has mycorrhizal fungi in it. These uh, mycorrhizal fungi um, actually colonize the roots of, of, of young plants. So you can see here this fuzzy growth here. That's uh, mycorrhizal growth. And the mycorrhiza uh, live on the outside of the plant root but they help with nutrient and water absorption. So you get plants that are just going to do a lot better because they have that added um, mycorrhizal partner in there to help them soak up the goodies. So uh, our seed planting, our early transplanting, we, we go with um, the mycorrhiza um, pro mix. So finally, we have plant seeds. And this shows, so this is, I'm not sure I can't read the label, what, what, which one this is. You see they're germinating nicely, probably the first one that came up, which is why I took a picture of this. Uh, here's a, the uh, plant label now, which has the common and scientific name, and it has a number, that original seed collection number that's associated with it. And that will follow it all the way through our, our plant sales. A delicate operation. Uh, what we do is um, we transplant from those seeded pots into the um, small, these are like little cup, almost, they probably a cup in volume. So that's the first transplant. And then uh, this is the seizing probably purple cone flower out of a flat uh, to plant. This is a uh, frost flower, and they're growing nicely. Um, and these are ready to be transplanted, either transplanted into the gallon size pot or if they're quart-sized containers, these are the ones that we sell at the end of April um, at our sale. Uh, not all plants, seeds behave the same. And one thing we've learned, um, this one, this um, plant, beautyberry, um, always takes two or three weeks for it to germinate. And I'm waiting and I'm thinking, oh, this seed's not any good, this is horrible. And then eventually they germinate and they're fine. And I'm thinking the, the um, recommendation for this, if you read um, um, different websites and so on, is not to stratify the seed. But I'm going to try this year, I'm going to actually put it into the month of cold, month, cold moist stratification, and I bet they germinate uh, faster. So again, each seed is unique. This is what our greenhouse starts to look like by the time we're done. So, we're, so this is the time of the season where it's too cold outside to be growing things outside. So everything is in the greenhouse and we eventually have tables in here and every surface, every flat surface is covered with, with seedlings at some point. And then, so now we're doing transplanting and uh, we transplant from those small uh, pots into gallon sized pots. This is our container yard. And you can see now this, these plants are for the most part for later sales. We're going to hold on to those for a month or two before we sell them. And then here is our array of uh, tree seedlings that have been uh, purchased from Missouri Department of Conservation and planted. Okay, um, <clears throat> we don't use this by design. We do not use hard chemical in our, our um, propagation. And so that means we've come, we have to come up with other ways to control pests. We have, we'll have dozens of these yellow sticky traps hung up in the greenhouse to attract any insect that dares to come into our greenhouse. And uh, especially if we have problems with uh, fungal gnats, 
and we do sometimes. The problem is that we're, we're probably overwatering if we have fungal nets, but we need we have to learn that, and, and sometimes we get uh, fungal nets. So this will help to take care of those. Uh, occasionally in the past, we've had aphids in the greenhouse because we're not spraying and they manage to get in. And we order thousands of these uh, aphid eating machines, these ladybugs, and release them into the greenhouse and we no longer have problems with aphids. Uh, so very effective. Uh, the other, um, so again, we're not spraying hard chemicals. And this is a selling point for growers because a lot of your big box stores uh, are, are spraying plants with systemic insecticides. And those systemic insecticides uh, remain in the plants. And when our naturalists put them out, um, they can actually poison the, the very insects and caterpillars and so on they're trying to grow. So uh, we don't use hard chemicals. Uh, there, are, there is another chemical, not a, it's not a chemical, it's another control that we use. On our lavelias, um, there is a little green caterpillar that comes in dozens of them will be on a, a lobelia plant. And they will take that plant down to the, a seedling, down to the midrib in overnight. So you come in, oh, what, what, what happened to this plant? So we prophylactically spray our lobelias with uh, a bacterium called um, um, BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, And that will kill caterpillars. We only put it on, we don't put it on the milkweeds and so on. Um, and and uh, we put it on our lobelias just to keep them from being consumed by um, caterpillars. So um, growing native plants is a year long process, as I hope I've been able to demonstrate. Um, everything from what we're doing now, seed collection, to what we'll be doing uh, next spring, we'll be transplanting uh, seedlings. So it's, it's a, uh, it's not something you just pick up and decide to do one day. It's something that you have to be you have to prepare to do. Uh, I know you can't probably even read these, but <clears throat> these are, uh, it's a list of references that I'm sure um, um, uh, Nate can get to you. And they are, like this is the uh, Lake to Prairie, which is a germination, beautiful uh, germination, guide to germination. Um, uh, this is a series, I haven't talked about this, but um, the Soil mixes that we use later on in our propagation are uh, per are um, made for us, and this gives recipes for um, those uh, soil mixes that we have made up. Um, this is these are just different um, propagation sites. One that Alyssa didn't mention the other day, but this is um, um, beautyberry here. This is the Atlas of Vascular Plants. And, oh, that's a beautiful book. I remember when I ordered it, I thought, oh, it's gonna have lovely pictures in it. That's the only picture in the book. The book consists of thousands of maps of Arkansas with distribution um, indicated for that particular plant. So this is beautyberry distribution in Arkansas. And uh, you can do this for all of the plants, the native plants that are found in our area. It's a very useful book when we're trying to decide whether we should be growing a plant uh, for our, our region. So that's our perfect storm um, and what we've done in our, what we've come up with for producing native plants for our needs. And um, I would welcome any comments or, or questions that people have. Well, thanks very much, Rose, for that. Uh for that wonderful amount of information. Um, we have quite a few questions that have come in. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to answer a few of these and um, Rose, if uh, when we're done, I'm going to hand it over to Paul. And uh, if you would just feel free to, to answer some of these questions in the Q and a box as well. Uh, you could definitely answer. I answered the ones I could, but I had some of these you are, uh, you would definitely know a lot more than I would. Um, uh, Michelle Wall uh, asked, uh, would you be able to share that spreadsheet that had lists of plants and the stratification information? Um, it's on, it's on uh, the Wild Ones website. So it's, it's one of the references at the end. It's Prairie to, uh, let's see, Prairie to Lake Wild um, website, Wild Ones website. So if you type that in and then go to the seed um, uh, germination section on their website. 
it's, it's a wonderful resource. I print it off and then it gets all ragged and dog-eared. So I print off another copy of it for myself um, because <laughs> we use it. We use it all the time. I've got it on the dining room table now with my, my seed collection. Okay. And uh, Carolyn Tedford is asking, what size is your greenhouse and where did you purchase your uh, flats and smaller pot? Or excuse me. Sorry, that uh, jumped. What size is your greenhouse and where did you purchase your greenhouse or high tunnel? Well, the joke in our group is that um, we should have another greenhouse because ours is only 18 by 24 feet. So it's a small greenhouse. Um, it wasn't originally, originally planned for this purpose. Um, but we can we, uh, produce thousands of plants uh, with the greenhouse. So that's, that's the size of the greenhouse. And then we have the container yard outside. And what was the other question? Uh, let's see. Uh, what is a good source to find out the seed management requirements? The seed... Uh, I'm not sure the, I understand. Uh, seed management requirements. I'm, I'm thinking the um, seed germination techniques and uh, stratification protocols and things like okay, that. Okay, okay. Uh, well, certainly that uh, Prairie to Wild, uh, Prairie to, Lake to Prairie Wild Ones website is a good source. But I, I like to use, this is just my favorite, there's so many out there, uh, the Lady Bird Johnson website. So if you type in Beautyberry and follow it with Lady Bird, um, you'll come up with the Lady Bird Johnson website and a description of that particular plant and pictures mm -hmm. and information about you know where it's located, but also information on seed collection and seed stratification if needed and so on. It's a great, it's, it's not comprehensive. You can't find everything there, but you can find a lot of information on that. All right. Well, Rose, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get Paul started. Um, Paul, or uh, Paul, if you're ready to go ahead and, and uh, share your screen. Right. And Rose, there's uh, several questions in the Q&A. If, okay. if you're uh, uh, able to answer those, that'd be greatly appreciated. A lot of those I can't answer. All right. So Paul Shell is the Plant Inspection and Quarantine Program Manager with the Arkansas Department of Agriculture. And uh, he's been with the agency for 31 years. His duties include working with nursery and landscape licensing, quarantines, invasive species surveys, plant product export documentation, that's a mouthful, and uh, fielding general science-oriented inquiries. He's also uh, designed and maintains the butterfly garden and uh, pollinator garden on the agency grounds in Little Rock. Uh, Paul has a biology degree from Hendricks College and worked with nurseries and co-owned a landscape company before joining the ADA. Uh, he's pretty good with natives, ornamentals, and uh, vegetative, vegetable gardening, as well as pests and uh, diseases of plants. Uh, while not working, he likes to build stone terraces on his steep yard, uh, growing many na native plants, uh, Japanese maples, and uh, vegetable gardens. He enjoys the diverse environments in Arkansas, but he says he doesn't get out as nearly as much as he would like. And uh, as a UCA graduate, I'd have to say, I don't know about anyone who graduates from Hendrix. They're just, they're suspicious. All right, Paul, you're good to go. Thank you very much very again. Good. For yes. Um, thanks, Nate, and thanks, Rose. That was excellent. I got a lot of good info from that. Appreciate it. Um, uh, and thanks for everybody tuning in. This is really this has been this is great. I'm so excited about this group, and um, I appreciate the introduction that you gave, Nate, about all the projects you have running. Um, as Nate said, Northwest Arkansas is booming and uh, population increasing and uh, uh, pretty phenomenal. And along with that population increase um, and land use increase, uh, there are certain challenges that uh, accompany that. Um, those would include loss of natural areas, erosion, pollution, um, excess nutrients entering watersheds. Um, with disturbance, you're going to get a lot of establishment of invasive species moving into those disturbances. Um, there could be loss of genetic diversity of your native plants. And all these are um, challenges can affect the uh, 
wild lands, prairies, creeks, rivers, and eventually your water supply. So um, having a ready supply of native plants will help construction, reclamation projects, landscapers, land and landowners furnish their properties with plants that will benefit the natural environment as well as beautify the outdoor living spaces for these people. So um, I am with the Arkansas Department of Agriculture and we do license uh, people who grow plants and sell plants. Is my screen on, Nate? My PowerPoint, is that on yet? I just see a big image of myself. Yeah, it looks, looks like you'll still need to, sh to uh, share your screen. I'm sorry, we're, I was working with a, uh, having some technical difficulties. Yeah. With um, um, okay. Well. <laughs> okay, I'm looking for share screen. Should be up at the, up at the uh, bottom of your screen. It'll be on your desktop. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. No. Maybe um, slideshow. That'll work. You're not seeing anything yet, yet though. I'm not seeing anything on uh, on your desktop. Yeah. Uh, well, dead air, isn't this great? This, I have a little bit of history in radio, so this is what everyone dreads. <laughs> um, I don't, I had the share screen earlier. Share. Well, I guess I could just talk. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I'll just talk. So yeah, I'll get to look at my lovely face. And, uh, um, in this, the state of Arkansas, we do regulate the sale of plants. And uh, the reason for this is there are certain pests and diseases that are commonly spread through nursery stock and grass sod. And uh, we are doing our best to prevent these from spreading and being released into the natural environment. Uh, so, um, we do have a nurseryman license. This is a license to grow plants. And um, these uh, pretty much we're just regulating the sale of woody plants. So if someone is exclusively growing perennial plants, uh, annual plants, ferns, non-woody herbaceous plants, they will not need a license from us unless they're shipping them out of state. Um, we have um, in the nurseryman category, we do have a limited nurseryman license. This is pretty uh, strict. Um, it's uh, for hobbyists mainly. Uh, this is 500 square feet of nursery growing area. No reselling of plants that others have grown. No wholesaling of plants and no landscaping. All those things are allowed with a regular nurseryman license, but um, not in the case of a limited license. Um, our annual license runs from 1st November to the end of October. Uh, this license is only needed when you are ready to start selling plants. So if, uh, if you're starting your your plants now, but you're not going to be looking at selling for a year, then don't worry about getting the license until you're ready to sell. Uh, it, uh, but our new season will begin November 1. 
I will, um, in the chat section, I'll have to type in uh, the license application, uh, which is available on our website. Uh, you can print off a license uh, and fill it out, or, or you can send it in with um, a check or money order. Um, the license fees, um, the limited license is $75 a year. Uh, the regular licenses run from $150 to $600 a year. Um, probably for the folks in this group, you're going to be looking at either a limited license or a level one at $150. A uh, level one license is uh, three acres uh, of plants, so that's considerable amount um, up to that. Uh, and then the, the other levels go up from there. but. Uh, the limited license, once again, is 500 square feet of nursery stock. Um, and those are sold directly to the public with no wholesaling and no landscape contracting. The regular license, level one, you can retail plants. And let's see if I can. Um, no, thought maybe I could get my screen up, but uh, the regular license, so you can you can landscape and you can retail plants uh, that others have grown. We do a nursery inspection whenever um, before we can issue the license. What we do on the nursery inspection is we once we receive your application, we will contact the field inspector in your area and uh, he or she will get in touch with you, uh, make arrangements to come by and inspect your plants. We're looking at the general health of the plants. We're looking for signs of insects and diseases. We're also checking invoices of um, any sources that you have received plants and uh, making sure that they have been, have you've received those from licensed and inspected nurseries and that all quarantines have been met. Uh, so uh, once we re have received the inspection, then we'll process your license and get it to you. So uh, the big thing that we're worried about with our quarantines is imported fire ants and Japanese beetles. So, um, you don't really have uh, fire ants up in your part of the state very much. They are um, limited by cold winters, but fire ants can move in nursery stock with soil and grass sod. So uh, the quarantine, there's a USDA federal quarantine that covers most of the Southeast United States and it is in place to prevent you from getting fire ants. You can receive nursery stock from the fire ant quarantine if those uh, have been treated with an insecticide that is going to prevent any fire ants from moving with those plants. And that would include containerized plants or ball and burlap plants. If these plants coming from the fire ant quarantine are bare root, then there's gonna be no fire ants moving with that. Uh, fire ants are an um, invasive species from South America. They uh, produce huge mounds. Uh, they uh, will boil up out of the mound if they're disturbed. They do sting and it's pretty painful sting and then it's followed by a really bad itch. Uh, they, as an invasive species, they can replace native ants. So they do impact the environment detrimentally. And so the quarantine is in place to prevent you from getting, the places that don't have them yet from getting them. Fire ants will move on their own. Uh, certain times of year, they do develop wings and can fly short distances, but they're not really good flyers. They're similar to a termite. They just kind of flop around in the breeze, but they can spread that way. The main way that fire ants are moved is through artificial movement from people 
moving nursery stock, moving grass sod, uh, moving hay or straw or uh, soil or used uh, soil moving equipment. Uh, a lot, a lot of people that are not familiar with fire ants uh, can use them with a um, velvet ant, which is a very large ant-like creature that you're going to see on the ground. Uh, that's those are actually wingless wasps. So um, fire ants are fairly large ants. They're not as big as like the the kind the black ants that get up in trees and stuff, but um, they're, they tend to be sort of a reddish brown and you'll see various sizes within a mound and that is, they just grow larger as they age. Pretty much the most of the entire um, Southeast United States is under the fire and quarantine in Arkansas. Roughly the line is roughly I-40 in South. Uh, That there's potential that fire ants could spread uh, well in northwest Arkansas, um, even up into Missouri. Um, they are limited by uh, cold weather, so a severe winter will definitely impact the population. Uh, but uh, they could certainly um, overwinter in northwest Arkansas. In areas where they um, are marginally hardy in the winter, often they will build mounds like on a south face of a building or a parking lot uh, island, a, a little planting island in the middle of a parking lot next to a sidewalk, things like that where the heat can radiate down and warm them in a, a slightly more so than they would be just in an open field or in a yard. Another uh, insect that we are, that is as of concern for nurseries is Japanese beetles. And um, I figure most of y'all are pretty familiar with them up in your part of the state. Um, Northwest Arkansas is considered, um, Benton County and Washington County are both considered infested with Japanese beetles. They are starting to spread in the um, western part of the state in the River Valley. Uh, we're seeing them along the Missouri border and even down into uh, Greer's Ferry Lake region and they're just starting to show up in central Arkansas. Japanese beetles are um, a pretty destructive creatures. They will uh, eat the leaves of several plants, um, native and exotic they tend to skeletonize the leaves, kind of leaving uh, lace, lacy veins behind. Um, they um, emerge around June and live, um, basically they just eat and, and make babies. Uh, and uh, lay, lay eggs late summer. Uh, those eggs hatch out and become grubs. The grubs live in the ground over winter and uh, emerge in June the following year. Uh, Japanese beetles can move in nursery stock with soil, bald and burlap plants, uh, containerized plants. Uh, this is an issue if you are going to be moving any plants west of uh, us. The western states do not have them and uh, obviously they don't want them. And uh, there are certain things that can be done if you do have them. Basically you want to um, kill out the adults so they're not laying eggs. And that can be just simple things like physically uh, uh, moving, brushing the, the beetles into a, a bucket of soapy water. Uh, or you can set traps out that have uh, rose kind of odor lure that uh, will trap them. Um, there are pesticides that um, like seven dust and things like that that will kill the adult beetles. And there are also products that will kill the grubs, uh, organic and conventional pesticides. Briefly, um, I want to talk about ginseng as well. Um, 
ginseng is a regulated uh, plant because it uh, potentially can be over harvested. Ginseng does grow uh, wild in uh, our rich forests, uh, often north face forests. And um, it can legally be harvested on private land between September 1 and December 1. Uh, and it can be sold to ginseng dealers between September 15th and December 31. Some people, uh, we, do have, we do have a ginseng nursery license that may be of interest to folks. Uh, this is a license to sell ginseng plants and ginseng seeds that you have grown. Um, that would be obtaining seeds from a ginseng seed dealer and planting those and then, then you can sell those. Uh, so those do not fall under the regulations of wild ginseng because uh, wild ginseng is, is protected, like I said. Uh, so that, that may be one thing to think about when you're uh, thinking about uh, growing nursery stock. You might wanna think about a ginseng dealer license, uh, excuse me, ginseng nursery license. Uh, this is a $25 a year fee for this. So um, just wrapping up, and I really apologize that my, I'm the only one that gets to look at my PowerPoint. But uh, I think when, when you're thinking about uh, what natives to plant in a given situation, think about um, where those plants are gonna be growing. Um, a, lot, a lot of times when we think about native plants, we think about those fabulous spring ephemerals that grow in rich forests and just look amazing uh, next, next to a creek or something. Well, that plant is not gonna work in a, uh, in a prairie, obviously. Uh, so think, um, try to match uh, the plants with a given situation based on light and moisture. And then some plants will have even more um, particular uh, requirements like pH, um, fertility, and things like that. Uh, as uh, I believe Rose said, um, well, um, with your hoop houses and greenhouses, you might want to think about a shade cloth to be used uh, in the warmer months because uh, greenhouses can get really hot in the summer. So having a little shade cloth on there, maybe something that you could apply during the growing season, uh, during the warmer months, that will um, might make your greenhouse or hoop house a little more tolerable. Uh, with, with a greenhouse and hoop house, sometimes there are certain um, pests that would be more, particularly more of a problem in these situations. Uh, if you do require the use of a re registered pesticide, this is something that would not be available at Walmart, Home Depot, things like that. Um, you can get a, a private applicator license with the Department of Agriculture. This is a free uh, license. It does require passing a test for this. And with this license, you could um, basically, they go over safety issues with, uh, with pesticide use, which is pretty important. And, and really everybody can benefit from, from learning about how to follow the safety directions and personal protection and things like that. And uh, with this license, you would have access to restricted use pesticides, which are those pesticides that are not available to the general public. Uh, the Cooperative Extension Service is an excellent resource for all things growing, uh, plant identification, insect identification, uh, tips on how to grow different plants. Uh, I use them constantly. They're really great folks and, and they know their stuff. The Arkansas Department of Agriculture does have a program called Arkansas Grown 
which is a website where you can list your products that you have for sale. So if you're growing native plants, you can be listed there uh, for free, uh, showing that you have native plants for sale. Uh, you can link on that website to your own website. So this would be a really good asset for folks who are trying to find customers. Um, another um, excellent group that you need to consider uh, being a part of is the Arkansas Native Plant Society. Uh, they, they know their plants. They often have scheduled trips and meetings where they go and look at very rare plants and uh, scenic places that are very rich in native flora. One last thing is Arkansas Green Industry Association. This is a private uh, trade group which promotes the uh, nursery and landscape industries in the state of Arkansas. And they have an annual meeting uh, usually in January in Hot Springs where they have a trade show where you can meet suppliers and affiliated folks. And also uh, they have seminars that talk about um, marketing and uh, different aspects of plants, designs, things like that. It's, it's a really good group. And so um, that's something else to consider. Um, and I really apologize that I could not pull up my PowerPoint but uh, in the comment section, I'm going to put my um, contact info and phone and uh, please feel free to give me a call anytime. And uh, that's all I've got. Uh, so I guess we've got time for questions, Nate. Yeah, uh, and we apologize for some of the technical difficulties. Um, Rose is not able to access the question and answer box. Uh, so what we're going to do is um, we're going to answer those outside of the webinar, and uh, I'll go ahead and provide those answers to to all the folks who participated in this today. So you, you will see feedback on that too. And okay. uh, Paul, I'd be happy to include um, your information or presentation or what you know whatever you'd like to include on that. Great. Um, we did get a question about ginseng growing. Uh, I believe, Paul, you've answered that. Um, Krista is asking, what level of licensure is required to be considered a dealer, and how does a dealer differ from a nurseryman? Great, great question. Uh, we have three plant licenses um, with the Arkansas Department of Agri Agriculture. Those are nurseryman, which is a grower, nursery dealer, which is a retailer, and landscape contractor. Now only one license is needed and that's going to be the one that best reflects your plant sales business. So if, if you're primarily um, just retailing plants, then that's going to be a dealer. Uh, but with that dealer license, you can propagate your own plants and you can landscape. And with nurserymen uh, or nursery person would probably be a little better, but I didn't make up the names, so uh, nurserymen, uh, that's a grower, but with the standard license, you can retail and you can landscape with this license. The exception is the limited license, the $75 a year license, uh, no landscaping, no retailing, no wholesaling, uh, and only 500 square feet or less uh, of your growing space for, um, for the limited license. Uh, ginseng, uh, the only license you need, you would need is if you are wanting to sell plants or sell ginseng seeds. If you are just growing ginseng on your property to someday um, sell the roots, then uh, you would not need any license at all on that. Um, there's uh, a, a process called wild simulated ginseng which is basically where you would acquire seeds. Uh, they're available on Amazon, eBay. Um, they need to be from a ginseng nursery. They, um, you cannot move wild ginseng seeds uh, uh, to another place. Um, any wild ginseng seeds need to be planted on site. But uh, with wild simulated process, you would gather, uh, you would acquire uh, ginseng seeds 
from a ginseng seed dealer and plant those on your property or on property that it would be suitable for ginseng. So basically rich, dense forest, uh, north face would be ideal. East face, sometimes uh, you can do pretty well, but it needs a pretty dense canopy and it needs fairly rich soil. Um, slightly um, neutral or slightly alkaline is probably best for ginseng. And uh, then you would just treat it like wild ginseng. You would not irrigate and fertilize, pest control, anything like that. Just let it struggle, let it grow, get gnarly and twisted. And, and that is going to be the roots that the buyers want. So after, um, after five years, uh, ginseng root can be dug and sold. Uh, it needs to be three prongs or more needs to um, be in red berries, uh, red berries replanted on site, and then dug F between September 1 and December 1. Okay. And uh, one of our producers in our grant program is asking, what are natural or organic ways uh, to remedy Japanese uh, beetle uh, infestations? Uh, they mm -hmm. have an organic farm and uh, also do not see keeping the greenhouse closed 24 seven as a, as a viable option. And I would like to know if there's any alternatives for that. Um, like I said, uh, physical uh, brushing them in the soapy water. Uh, I, I would research spinosad and, or maybe rotenone, which are both organic um, insecticides. Also, there is a biocontrol called um, milky spore disease, which is um, a bacteria, I believe, or it's fun it might be fungal. Uh, it lives in the soil and um, it will kill the grubs. Uh, basically, it kind of cannibalizes the grubs and then, uh, then it reproduces that way. So uh, with milky spore, you're looking at a few years before you're really going to see any results. But that's, that's the only organic methods I know of that uh, someone who's an expert on organics can probably um, advise uh, other options as well. Okay. And Paul, I believe that's it. Um, several other questions have been asked, and uh, like I said, we're gonna get with we're gonna get with some of these questions and um, get answers for them, and then send them up in a follow up email. That will probably take a few days. Um, this uh, webinar will also be is also recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, uh, which I'll type in the chat box here. It is. Um, uh, we did a, a webinar last weekend on, or last week on Thursday, and uh, that should be live on our YouTube channel now. Uh, we'll be very, um, uh, you'd be welcome to, to watch that as well. Um, this one should be live by Wednesday of next week. Um, You should see receive a, an email follow up with this uh, three days after after this. Uh, should also have a link for reviewing this uh, through Zoom uh, on, on their on demand feature. You can access it through that, as well as the YouTube channel when we get it uploaded. Again, it should take about by next by Wednesday of next week. Uh, Paul and Rose, thank you both uh, very much for for attending. Thanks. It's been my pleasure. And uh, once again, I apologize for some of the technical difficulties that we, we've had today. Oh, it's um, coming from me. Rose, tech, Rose temporarily lost her internet connection and, and can't seem to access all the features right now. Yeah, actually, uh, it was um, my computer just gave up. Um, <laughs> it wasn't the internet. I don't know what went wrong. Thankfully, oh, yeah. it happened after my presentation. Oh. Okay. And uh, for folks who live in the Beaver Lake watershed, um, you, if you receive our newsletter, you, you're probably going to be qualified to, to participate in this program if you're interested. 
Um, if you would, you can, if you're interested in applying, just let me know, send me an email, nate at beaverwatershedalliance.org. Um, and uh, we do have two more sessions after this, well, crossing my fingers, hoping we don't have technical issues with those. Um, the first is gonna be, uh, let me go to my slide here. So the, the, we've done four of these. The next one is going to be October 22nd at, from 1 to 2 p.m. Um, that's going to be uh, Mervyn Wallace with Missouri Wildflowers Farm. He's going to be talking about some of the economics of operating a large-scale native plant business and uh, something that we would like to see encouraged up here in Northwest Arkansas. The last one is going to be October 28th with a, a, a recorded session with Mark King with the Dripping Springs Garden, uh, October 28th, 1 to 2.30 p.m. This is a recorded session. Uh, we were intending to have a field trip uh, some time ago, but with the, with the pandemic, we had, to, we had to put a halt to that. Um, so we went out and we took a very detailed recording session. Uh, we're still trying to get Mark to potentially um, make an appearance and answer any questions that everyone might have. But right now, it's, a, it's kind of a watch party. Um, like I said, we'll go through the questions and send everyone feedback and uh, on, on the questions they've asked. Um, thank you all very much for attending. Thank you for participating in the poll. Um, and we look forward to seeing you on uh, Thursday and Wednesday uh, next week and the following week. All right. Thank you very much for participating and uh, hope you all have a, a good weekend and go, go do something fun. Enjoy this wonderful weather we're having. All right. Have a good one. Thanks, Mac. Thank you.